It's the oldest hatred in the world, and even some of our churches have fallen for it. We'll explain that next. Just in the you window. Jew, y'all are Jews? Uh, we are, yes, we're Jewish. No, we can't support Jews here. Uh, uh, if you're trying to help people get jobs, why did you trash the uh, whole economy in the first place? You control all the banks, any right? We don't, we don't work at banks, or we don't own banks. We're... You Jews are all alike. You want to control the banks oh my God. so you can get people's money. No, no, we're not going to take your Jewish agenda and put it on our window. No way. But this kind of ugly anti-Semitism is commonly heard these days. This is Understanding the Times Radio with Jan Markell. Jan meets today with Olivier Melnick, a Northwest Regional Director of Chosen People Ministries. Olivier Melnick was born in Paris, France, and raised in a secular Jewish family. His parents survived the Second World War and the Holocaust, but the Melnicks didn't attend synagogue or practice an Orthodox Jewish lifestyle. However, Olivier did come to know Christ as his personal Messiah. We'll hear that story this hour. In his latest book, End Times Anti-Semitism, a new chapter in the longest hatred, Melnick explains how there'll be a rapid increase in the frequency and severity of hatred for the Jewish people. Jan and Olivier will discuss how anti-Semitism is a sign of our times. Here now is Jan Markell. Europe has seen a rise in anti-Semitic attacks over the last few weeks. Most blatantly, Jewish-owned businesses vandalized and one burned in Paris after an anti-Israel rally. The UK has also reported a spike. More than 100 incidents reported. And America is not immune. Smaller acts of vandalism directed not towards Israeli institutions, but towards synagogues, like the one in Miami, sprayed with Nazi swastikas, the word Jew written in cream cheese on a car. The ADL says anti-Semitic hate speech is spreading on social media sites and that online hackers have targeted synagogue websites with claims denying the Holocaust. And welcome to the program. And we're going to discuss some of these topics related to that little intro I use sort of as a tease and difficult things to talk about for the next couple of segments. And I'm pleased to have online with me from the West Coast, Olivier Melnick. He was born in France, the son of Holocaust survivors. He's an international speaker on the subject of anti-Semitism, and he serves with Chosen People Ministries. We're going to talk about some related issues, including a new book he's written, called End Times Anti-Semitism, a new chapter in the longest hatred. Olivier, welcome to the program for the first time. Well, thank you, Jan. Thank you for having me. You have a fascinating background because you, like me, were really influenced by Hal Lindsey's late great planet Earth. Talk to me about that for a second. Yes, indeed. I I, I was, you know, I was uh, born and raised in France, Jewish family, but not religious, not practicing at all. In my early 20s, I met uh, the woman that would become my wife, fell in love with her, and back in France, after visiting in the U.S., she started witnessing to me and sharing the good news uh, from the Bible, which did not impress me. I was intimidated by that. And then she gave me the book, The Late Great Planet Earth, and I started reading it on my way to work every day, and I actually missed a couple of stops on the subway because I was so engrossed in the Mm -hmm. book, I was fascinated with it. And I got to the rapture, and I panicked. I'm going like, whoa, if this is true, which of course I didn't believe it was true, but if this is true, she's going to leave and I'm going to be behind, I'm going to be left behind and we're going to be separated. And I, so I started talking to her about that and I asked her, is there anything you can do so that you can stay behind, like putting lead shoes or something? And she <laughs> said, no, but you know what to do to come with us because we talked about that. And that's when I prayed to uh, invite Yeshua, or Jesus, in my heart. That was uh, summer, July of uh, 1983. Wonderful story, and uh, that book impacted me as well. It kind of stabilized me, and then I went to Israel for the first time at the same time, so I had a double impact there. Now, your mother actually survived the Holocaust, actually thanks to a farmer who shared uh, their one-room home with her, and in fact, then she pretended to be a good Catholic, which is how she survived the Holocaust. You lost a grandparent in the Holocaust, so you've got some history here going back to the Holocaust, and you certainly know about anti Semitism, and you wrote this newest book, End Times Anti-Semitism, a new chapter in The Longest Hatred, and you say, because I want to warn people about what is coming. What do you think is coming? If any good student of the Bible 
it, w- it won't take him very long to see that Israel is in the crosshair. I mean, for, for many, many years, uh, in biblical days, and, and of course, the modern state of Israel, who's pointing, you know, at, at Israel is Satan, you know, the, the ultimate enemy, because he hates everything that God loves and loves everything mm-hmm. that God hates. So he's going to go after Israel, and I think, and the Jewish people, of course, and I think what we're seeing right now is, I mean, anti-Semitism has been ongoing since the very first Jewish people. We can track it to the biblical days. But I see we're seeing a, a rebirth or a morphing of anti-Semitism over the years. And in the last few years, I've noticed what I've coined a eschatological anti-Semitism or end times anti-Semitism, a, a very irrational new trend or new breed of anti-Semitism that I've been tracking for the last five years, which led me to do the research and write my new book. You say this, and I think this is really profound, and I kind of want, want to build on it just a little bit. You write, rather, the prince of this age is about to be deposed by the king of kings, the prince of peace. But Satan's approach in his last moments of fame is that if indeed he goes down, and he is going to go down, he will double his efforts to take Israel and the Jews with him in a final effort to spit in God's face. The God of the Bible unconditionally loves Israel and the Jewish people to the point of promising great blessings to those who will bless Israel and curses to those who will curse Israel, as seen in Genesis 12, 3. Now, Olivier, that should be read from every church pulpit in the Western world, what I just Amen. read there, and that's from your book here, because a lot of the opposite sentiment is coming through the pulpits uh, of the Western church today. Right. That is true. What we need to, to understand, you know, going back to, uh, to what the enemy, uh, to what Satan is doing, a lot of people within the church today do not realize that not only God is not finished with Israel, but God has a plan to use Israel until the very end of times. And it's actually not until the Jewish people are back in the land and, and they finally realize that they missed the, the Messiah when he first came, and they all corporately say, Baruch haba Hashem Adonai, mm-hmm. blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, that Yeshua, Jesus, actually returns. Now, we're not talking about a rapture here. We're talking about the second coming. And at that time, Satan is out of a job, and he does not like his retirement plan. So <laughs> he's going to do everything he can to stop that from happening. He knows he's defeated, but he's going to go at it, like I said, double his effort as much as he can. And and, and most people in the church don't realize that. They don't really study prophecy. So they, they don't see the importance of Israel up to the very end of God's program. And of course, the blessing and cursing is, you know, is icing on the cake, but it's also very true from, uh, from Genesis 12, 3, that uh, there is a, a history of God really taking seriously those who bless and those who curse. We, right. can, we, we can even talk about but that. But since that's a biblical command, or, you know, strong suggestion there in Genesis 12, 3, why do you suppose the pulpits are so silent about this topic? For a long time now, you know, I've, be, I've been speaking in, in churches for over 20 years. I regularly get invited, and it's, you know, fewer and fewer. But what I find is is a lot of churches now are adhering to this faulty theological perspective of view of, of the Bible known as uh, supersessionism oh, or yes, uh, yes. replacement yes. theology. And so the, the pastors are not going to preach the importance of Israel because they believe that they and their church have replaced Israel, and God is, because Israel, you know, uh, rejected Messiah, God is done with them. They okay. completely ignore the eternal, unconditional covenant found in Genesis 12 and, uh, and following chapters, the fact that God is not going to change his mind. If God changes his mind on Israel, right. then he's a liar. Well, he can change his mind against the Christian Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. Okay, so are you saying, I, I think I hear you saying, by the way, folks, you're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. I'm Jan Markell. And I have on the line from the West Coast, Olivier Melnick. He's with Chosen People Ministries. He's got a fascinating new book out, End Times Anti-Semitism, A New Chapter in the Longest Hatred. You have to get it online, and that's found at the new... At, we'll start over. You have to get it online, and that's found at newantisemitism.com, newantisemitism.com. We're not carrying it here at Olive Tree Ministries, and we're not giving out phone numbers today, but uh, find it at newantisemitism. Dot com And Olivier, you just said something that I want to develop a little bit here, and we need to do it quickly because I have so many bullet points I want to talk to you about. But you said at one time you were kind of doing things 
on this topic in the churches a little more frequently than you're doing now. And you see, I shared the same thing. As a matter of fact, I wrote about that some six months ago, and you even replied when I wrote my e-newsletter about I had open doors to churches 30 years ago that wouldn't quit. I could be doing them seven days a week, three times a day. Today, that is not the case. And it goes back to the state of the church again. But I hear you saying the same thing, that at one time doors were more open, and now they're beginning to close. Yes, uh, as as a whole, the ministry, uh, Chosen People Ministries, we have seen in the last 10 years, I will say, a uh, constant decrease of interest in mm-hmm. inviting people to speak about Israel, Jewish ministry, how to reach Jewish people with the gospel of, of the Messiah. You know, I get invited into a church. Most of the time, if I'm invited, they know the topic, they want to hear it. It's going to be a good response, going to be positive interaction. There's always a couple of people in the, in the audience that are going to be, you know, in disagreement in the Q&A session at the end, but for the most part, the pastor will invite me, and they want to hear it. But what people don't know is that what maybe took us 10 phone calls in the past Mm -hmm. to get an invitation might take us 100 now. We get a lot of people saying, no, we're not interested, leave us alone, we don't want to have anything to do with Jewish ministries. What about the poor Palestinians? What about, you know, and on and on. You said the magic words, what about the poor Palestinians? We could analyze until the cows come home or whoever comes home. The reasons for all of this, and and there are a number of of reasons for all of this, but the plight, the perceived plight of the poor Palestinians, I think, is the biggest factor here. Would I be correct? Well, you're either correct and I'm correct or we're both wrong, (laughs) because I agree with you, (laughs) but I don't think we're wrong. I think for the last 50 years, there's been a rewriting of history and exactly. indoctrinating of, yes. of, of the masses who do not check their facts. I often say to people, you know, what used to be 50 years ago when people pushed the rather new political Palestinian agenda under Arafat in the mid-60s, when they started pushing that, people questioned it. People had doubts. Uh, people would look at this uh, new perspective on the Middle East and they would go like, is it true? Are the Palestinians really displaced people? It, it took a while for people to buy into it, but now 50 years down the road. The question is no longer, can this be true? Are the Palestinians really a displaced people? The question has shifted to now, they've accepted that as truth, and the question is now, how can we make sure Israel doesn't go after the Palestinians, mm-hmm. the poor victims? Mm-hmm. This is not even the same question anymore. I'm running into the same thing, Olivier, and I want to insert something else here. I, I'm trying to say it in a way that I, I don't want to offend my audience here, but I find that if I post articles about the topic we're covering today, very few of these articles are going to be read. If I do a program like today, my stats will be low, listening stats. I'm just being blunt that somehow people have been conditioned that this topic is not real relevant in their lives, and I think that that's very, very scary. Let me just insert a few other things that I think we're dealing with, Olivier. Talking with Olivier Melnick, Chosen People Ministries, we're dealing with the issue of anti-Semitism, but also how is this topic received or not received in the church? I find, Olivier, that there is a prominence of other theologies that are not helpful, amillennialism, postmillennialism, Christian Palestinianism, which uh, Jesus was a Palestinian, in other words, which we know is not true. You've already referenced replacement theology, the rise of that in every mainline Protestant church, every Catholic church, and for that matter, a lot of evangelical churches, the rise of the cry of social justice among young people. You've kind of referenced that. A decline in dispensationalism, which would have a literal interpretation of the tribulation, Antichrist, and Israel's huge role in the last days, and particularly the tribulation. All of this is, and then you've got voices. I wish I could name them all, and I'm I'm prohibited because of some networks I air on, but I can name the voice of perhaps Lynn Hybels, who spends a good deal of her time denouncing Israel and pleading for the plight of the perceived so-called persecuted Palestinians. But Olivier, that's not true. They're not persecuted. No. As a matter of fact, I just returned from Israel. I was on an a, a 11 day, took a group of people to Israel. And unfortunately, I had on the last day before we took our plane, I had uh, to take one of our tour members to the hospital because she fell uh, right in front of the Damascus Gate in uh, Jerusalem. So we went to Hadassah Hospital, and I had never been into an, uh, an Israeli hospital, so it was an experience. But right there, I witnessed for the, like the almost five hours I was there a mix of 
of Israelis, Palestinians, Muslims, Arabs, Jews, all sitting together, working together, helping each other, being taken care by doctors, orderlies that were Palestinian, doctors that were Jewish. You could not see any animosity. It was just business as usual in the hospital when you take care of people. And it was a mix of both sides. Mm -hmm. And that's what Israel is is all about. And and, and people don't realize that. And most people that buy into the Christian Palestinianism, which uh, what I call Christian Palestinianism, I say it's replacement theology on steroids. It's the next step. Most people that buy into that have never been to Israel. They just buy the lies and they just, you know, the reversal of the role of the, the victim becoming the perpetrator and the perpetrator becoming the victim, it's accepted. But it's not true. I mean, Israel is very careful about how they treat the Palestinians and, and, and the Arabs. But it doesn't help to have Christian voices. And I sat in the auditorium at my alma mater, Bethel University, Bethel College, St. Paul, Minnesota. My radio producer, Larry Kutzler, was in the very same meeting with me as well as some others as we listened to a seminar, Hope for the Holy Land. Well, not only was there no hope, it was all lies about the Holy Land. It was Lynn Heibel's World Vision representative, Sammy Awad, and others for, for an hour and a half telling untruths, coming here from Christian voices to Christian students, untruths about Israel. And they, at the close, the president of the university got up and he said something to the effect, oh my goodness, I wish I could have been raised in a home that honored the Palestinians instead of a home that that had maps of Israel all over the walls. We, I wanted to see some maps of, of where the Palestinians live. So things like that, Olivier, don't help. No, they, I mean, I, I, I had the same experience because they came, uh, she yeah. came with Sami Awad to Seattle and I decided I was going to go yeah. and listen live. And it was repugnant. I mean, uh, uh, historical revisionism and not based on facts. And, and what's scary is that outside of the church, people are not believers. People do not have the Holy Spirit. People do not have the, the wisdom and the discernment. You'd say, well, maybe they need to be educated. But we have such a growing number of people within evangelical church that are actually changing their views. Even people that I respected when I was a baby believer, I won't say the name, but it's a, it's a, it's a person that has a program when they answer Bible questions. I know. I'll let you say the name if you're allowed to say I'm it. I'm not but. allowed to say it. I'm okay. not allowed to say this gentleman's name, and it's really troubling me that I can't. Yeah, but you know who I'm talking about. And this person was actually invited at Crest at the checkpoint uh, last year yes. and delivered a 30-minute message that was such a diatribe against the Jewish people, where 30 years ago when I became a young believer, I used to call the program and I used to really mm-hmm. learn from this person. So it, how people can change camps like this from one to one end to the other. To me, I can only explain it by what I wrote into this new book, End Times Antisemitism, which is highly irrational. All kinds of antisemitism is converging together for what might be the final attempt. Final uh, attempt. Yeah. Yeah, to obliterate God's chosen people. Folks, we're going to pick up on this. I've got to take a short break. When I come back, I'm going to continue with Olivier Melnick. You can find his book at newantisemitism.com. We're not carrying it. Find Find it at newantisemitism.com back in just a couple of minutes. Here's a quick reminder. All our new Understanding the Times broadcasts are archived to our website, olivetreeviews.org, every Saturday morning. You can order a compact disc recording of this program to pass along to family and friends when you phone 763-559-4444. Want to learn more about our theme today? You can order Olivier Melnick's book, End Times Antisemitism, a new chapter in the longest hatred, at his website, newantisemitism.com. Every weekend, our goal is to bring you the best communicators of how current events are revealed through the lens of Scripture. Thank you for making this broadcast one of the most listened to weekend programs in America. You can become our financial partner when you send your tax deductible gifts to Olive Tree Ministries. Post Office Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. You can also support us safely and securely online at olivetreeviews.org. Jan returns shortly. Please stay with us. Our recent Understanding the Times conference brought great clarification to the many issues of the day we are watching in daily headlines. They will only make sense when interpreted from the Bible. 
Our times are perilous. The church is caving to apostasy. America cannot be found in biblical prophecy. Europe is preparing for the Antichrist. But the good news is that Jesus Christ will return for his bride very soon. Our speakers included Amir Sarfati. The Antichrist has to be a good friend of Israel, has to serve the interests of the people of Israel and the Jewish people, has to be liked by them to the point of even worship by them. Pastor J.D. Farag. The clarion call is to know that not only are we living in the last moments of world history as we know it, but we need to know what to do while there's still time. Dr. Mark Hitchcock. The enemy is working feverishly today in seminaries, denominations, and churches to pry people away from trust in the inerrant, inspired, living Word of God. And apostasy is an inside job. Michelle Bachman. The final judgment over Babel goes hand in hand with the second coming of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and the dawn of the messianic time, which will be centered on Zion. Why not order complete sets of CDs and DVDs today? Five messages are offered on DVD for just $35 plus $5 shipping in the U.S. Five messages are offered on CD for $30 plus $5 shipping in the U.S. DVDs contain valuable speaker PowerPoint. Order online at olivetreeviews.org, olivetreeviews.org, or call us at 763-559-4444, 763-559-4444. You can also write to us at Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311, Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. really easy to say that Jews are responsible for a large part of the problem in the world today. I've seen it a lot lately. It used to be very taboo and it is not anymore. It's weird. It's very weird. Anti-Semitism has never gone away. The evil of the Jews is the closest I come to believing in magic because they just never stop being evil. Like I just don't understand how this never goes away. It never goes away. Jan's guest on Understanding the Times Radio this hour is evangelist and author Olivier Melnick, writer of the book End Times Anti-Semitism, a new chapter in the longest hatred. A member of the Board of Directors for Chosen People France, Olivier also serves as a guest commentator on WorldNet Daily and Watch.org. If you just joined us, Jan and Olivier are discussing anti-Semitism as a sign of the end times. Let's get back to their conversation. Once again, Jan Markell. And welcome back. And remember, this program is posted to my website every Saturday morning, olivetreeviews.org. If you can't get the signal, if you miss a program every Saturday, olivetreeviews.org. You can become a CD subscriber and get a CD of every program. you got to call us on that. And why don't you sign up for my print and e-newsletter. That's how I keep in touch with you. And let's see, if you send a gift, particularly a radio gift, would you always tell us what station you're listening to? On 830-some stations, we like to credit your gift properly. I'm talking for these two segments with Olivier Melnick, and he serves with uh, Chosen People Ministries. He serves part of the time in France, which is where he is from. His parents were in the Holocaust. He lost his grandfather in the Holocaust. And we're talking heavily about the scourge of anti-Semitism and his newest book, End Times Anti-Semitism, A New Chapter in the Longest Hatred. Got to find that at newantisemitism.com. You'll also find a lot of his articles there, which are excellent. So I encourage you to visit that website. Olivier, let me go to a topic here, which is just a little bit perplexing. And I know listeners are wondering about it as well. And you write about it. You've got a comment in your book that liberals and radical Islam agree on on destroying Israel. And and by the way, some of those liberals are Jews (laughs) who agree about destroying Israel. Can you help us understand this at all? Well, fully understand it, I don't think so, because it puzzles me as well. Let's start 
with the first part of the question, you know, liberals and radical Islam. When you look at the ideology of radical Islam, and the first thing is people need to stop calling Islam a religion. It's not a religion, it's an ideology. It mm-hmm. includes a religion, but it's got all kinds of other things. It's got a legal system, it's got a banking system. It, it really has a lot more than just a religion. So the ideology of this, of radical Islam is on the opposite side of the spectrum from the ideology of liberalism. Yet, I, I recently ran into a, a series of articles and commentaries on a group called Queers for Palestine. In, and this is their own name. This is not what I'm calling them. This is their own name by their own choice. A group of practicing homosexuals that are promoting the Palestinian agenda. And it, to me, it is so ridiculous because if they only took a second to sit down and realize that the minute they agree to be under Palestinian authority or, or worse, the Muslim agenda and the Sharia law, then they just lose their life because they're not allowed to practice right. this kind of lifestyle. But that doesn't seem to be an issue. What the issue is, I need to be on the side of those who promote the Palestinian agenda because I hate the Jews. So we have a group that's completely opposite ideologically to the radical Islam uh, or to even Islam as, as an ideology, not even radical Islam. Islam, and then uh, they promote the Palestinian agenda. So that's why I say they have nothing in common except the hatred and goal of the complete destruction of Israel and the Jewish people, which to me can only be explained, again, by this irrational push of the enemy, I mean, this this final anti-Semitism, it's so irrational because of things like this. If I can just throw a name or two out there, I mean, one of these uh, liberals who hates Israel and hates himself, I mean, it's just George Soros, and the, the, there are the Soros types. There are lots of Jews who can't stand a lot of the things we're talking about that you and I hold very, very sacred, and that would obviously the nation of Israel, the, her rebirth is miraculous. Right, absolutely. Well, people like George Soros or other the Jewish people in maybe more academic field, I, I think they, they look at Israel and the Jewish people in a different way because to them it is more important to seek social justice okay. than mm-hmm. to seek a connection with the land or a connection with the people. And, and maybe it is, and I don't know the case of every single one of them, but maybe it is that they were raised in such a way that they were not really raised in an environment where their family gave them a, an appreciation for Israel, for the Jewish people, for their heritage. Maybe that's part of it. Well, I think part of it is just plain, it's just demonic. But I want to stay in this vein, and I want to talk to you for a minute here about, uh, I, I recently encountered a pastor, evangelical pastor, actually, I've known this gentleman for a couple of decades, and he knows what I do, and evangelical pastor asking me this question, I was quite taken aback. He said, how can you say such good things about the Jews? Now, this pastor, again, he's evangelical, he's premillennial, he's dispensational, he believes what you and I believe, Olivier. I said to him, I stand by the Jews for, first of all, God has called them to be a separate and a chosen people. But I said, their inventions have made our lives much easier. Their medical discoveries have cured millions of people, including President Jimmy Carter a couple of years ago of his brain cancer. Their intelligence analysis has aided America in our war on terror. More importantly than all of those things, they gave us the Bible, the writers of the Bible. They gave us our Messiah. The Bible says that salvation is of the Jews. How on earth can you say these people are deplorable people? Which is what this evangelical pastor was saying to me, in spite of all the positives here, this evangelical pastor was saying to me, these are deplorable people. Jan, I'm listening to you, and, and this makes me this makes me think, and we probably want to say a word about this, about the BDS movement. Because this pastor saying the Jewish people are deplorable, and how can we support Israel and the Jewish people? And then you said it right. I mean, all the Jewish inventions, not even to mention how many Jewish Nobel Prizes yes. over the last uh, so many years, out of a, such a small group of people in the world, only 15 million and almost 7 billion people. But those who, who want to ostracize the Jewish nation and the Jewish people and are really interested in taking part in the BDS movement. And what I mean by BDS for your audience is boycott, divestment, sanctions against Israel. It's a big movement that was started in 2005 in in the Palestinian Authority, actually. And churches are uh, joining that movement now. And people want to uh, boycott the companies that do business with Israel because it's a shame that they would support them. But what they don't realize, like you just said, is that the the cell phone uh, technology was invented by Israel. The thumb 
drive some of the computer technology. So they will boycott, you know, maybe Jaffa oranges or little Israeli cookies because that sounds good and that's convenient. But if they really want to be consistent in their boycott, then they should really go all the way and nobody will because they wouldn't be able to function to this society without some of the Israeli inventions. But that, of course, they don't think that way. They just want to go when it's easy and boycott Israel for what they're doing, which of course they're not doing. But that's what the BDS movement is. And that BDS movement, you find it on American campuses, you find it in Hollywood, you find it in churches. All denominations now are saying, we're not going to support Israel anymore. Well, I'm going to stay in this stream of talk here. I want to play a short soundbite. I'm not going to name this man. He's very prominent online on YouTube, and he spends almost all of his time denouncing the things that you and I hold pretty sacred here anyway, as it concerns God's call on the uh, nation of Israel and the Jewish people. It's about three minutes, and I think uh, my listeners are going to be rather astounded that, again, this fellow calls himself an evangelical. I have not had a face-to-face conversation with him, but I have seen enough of his YouTubes that I believe that probably a good part of his theology is relatively sound, but here he's really, really, well, shocking. Israel, the the physical nation, is still going God's chosen people. This is what they'll even say. Oh, the fig tree is Israel. Oh, the fig tree is Israel. Israel's the fig tree. And they'll even say, oh, Matthew 24 talks about the blossoming of the fig tree. And that's Israel. That's Israel. Yeah, Israel's the fig tree. All right. The one that got cut down. The one you say, well, how do you explain them coming back in 1948? Uh, it's a fraud. That's how I explain it. They didn't come back. It's a, it's a bunch of white people that came back from Europe bunch of Ashkenazi fake imposters that came back or I mean all of them are you know microscopically part Jewish but you know some of them that are more Jewish than others that's not the point they don't believe in Jesus let them be anathema maranatha because if any man loves not the Lord Jesus Christ let him be anathema I mean isn't that what the Bible said but no no they're the chosen people no they're not we're the chosen generation we're the royal priest we're the elect of God but let me tell you something the Jews not only were they scattered as a punishment in AD 70 and AD 135, they've been hated in every country that they've ever lived in for the last 2,000 years. In fact, did you know that I, I believe 51 different countries throughout history have expelled all the Jews? Because the one that you think of is 1492 when they were kicked out of Spain, but they've been kicked out of England, kicked out of the Netherlands, kicked out of Germany, kicked out of France, over and over again. It, you know, all throughout history, even the rabbis will tell you that they've been hated and persecuted every single country they've ever lived in for the last 2,000 years. And people will say, oh, that's because they're God's people. That's why they're hated. No, Jesus Christ said in Matthew 24, And is it Matthew 24, the chapter where they try to say, oh, this is just to the Jews? In Matthew 24, Jesus Christ said this, you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Now, have the Jews been hated for the name of Jesus? No, they've been hated because of being bankers and they've been hated for blaspheming Jesus, but they dead sure have not been hated because of Jesus' name. They don't claim the name of Jesus, okay? So why have they been persecuted and hated and kicked out of every country, you know, over the course of the last few thousand years. Simply this, they're under the curse of God for rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the Bible says, he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So you've got a bunch of people who should know better because they're looking at the Old Testament, and yet they're rejecting the Lord, and God's wrath is on them. You're listening to Understanding the Times Radio. I'm Jan Mark Hill. I have on the line from the West Coast, Olivier Melnick. He's with Chosen People Ministries. Olivier, your response to what you just heard? Well, you got my blood boiling. I know. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> my response, well, first of all, the danger of somebody like this person is that they mix the truth with the lies. So people will listen to it and go like, well, yes, like, for instance, when he's talking about something will happen to you for, you know, for you'll be persecuted. Well, Jesus is talking to believers, but he's mixing that with the rest of his big picture of his agenda of ostracizing and rejecting the Jewish people, which is wrong. So people are going to be, you know, taking the whole package and not be able to decipher that it's mixed truth with lies. Mm-hmm. 
But that's the, the big danger of our day and age and the, the, this apostasy where people just put a little bit of lies in a lot of truth and it kind of get it disappears in there and you think it's the truth. And that's kind of like what he did in that, in that little segment. He's, he's way off. Yes, the Jewish people have rejected Messiah at his first coming because they expected a Messiah that would come and reign and conquer and be the king of Israel. And uh, so they, that's not what happened. But he's also completely ignoring, he's talking about the Old Testament and the Jewish people should know better. He should know better that in the Old Testament, the scriptures like Zechariah 12.10, when they finally, when they call upon the one whom they have pierced, and they will they mourn for him like one mourns for an only son, when the Jewish people all call on Yeshua and, and say that he is the Messiah, there he's, he's ignoring the scriptures like this, he's ignoring the fact that regardless of their disobedience, God has never going to destroy or renege on Israel. In uh, Jeremiah 31, 35 through 37, God tells us that if you can count the stars and the moon yes. and measure the earth, he will destroy uh, Israel. And at the end, he says, for all that they have done to me. So he's, uh, God is agreeing. They have disobeyed. They've disobeyed over and over and over. But I have given him my word. It's an unconditional covenant. It's not if you obey, I will. It's simply because of who I am. I will. That's a big difference. So I think this man is ignoring a lot of scripture to promote an agenda of hatred. Well, I think I believe he's a Baptist pastor. All I can think of is a little saying. I think I have it memorized. How odd of God to choose the Jews, but not as odd as those who choose the Jewish God, but spurn the Jews. I want to include, and our time is slipping away, your parents, because I've got listeners right now who are witnessing to loved ones. They're kind of not getting very far. They kind of face a closed door every time they try to bring up the name of the Lord and the importance of uh, eternity and salvation. And yet you were able to lead both your parents. They were both elderly, and this is recently. You were able to lead them both to the Lord. Why don't you give that story in a nutshell? Because I think we've given some dark information here today, and we folks need to hear an uplifting story. Well, I, I became a believer in uh, 34 years ago, and soon after becoming a believer, I started praying for the rest of my family, my whole family being Jewish. I wanted them to uh, meet their Messiah like I had. And, of course, my mother lost her faith in God when her father was taken by the Gestapo in front of her eyes when she was 15, and he died in Auschwitz. My dad claimed to always be an atheist. God doesn't exist. I don't have time for him. That was it. That's the, the upbringing I had. Jewish, ethnically, but that's the upbringing I had. And so I started praying for my parents. As a matter of fact, I prayed for them regularly for 28 years. That's a long time. And I always thought, I'm not going to be the one leading them to the Lord because, you know, what they say in the Bible, a prophet is never like in his own country. You know, when you go back to your family and you try to lead them to the Lord, they remember the old you. And they go like, oh, all of a sudden you've changed and now you want me to be like you. So it's, I always thought somebody else will lead them to the Lord. Well, about uh, six years ago, uh, when my dad was dying of cancer, I went back to France one more time to what I thought would be my final goodbyes, which end up being my final goodbyes. And I, I talked to my mother, and it was one-on-one with her, and I said, Mom, Dad is on his way out. He's not doing too well, and uh, they'd been together for 63 years. And uh, I said, you know, you, got, you have to rely on God. You cannot rely on man, because man is always going to disappoint you, even me. You know, the family, we're all going to disappoint. But God doesn't. And she agreed read, which was surprising to me. But then she looked at me and she said, Olivia, you want me to trust in the God that allowed for my father to be taken and killed by the Nazis when I was 15? That's the same God, right? I can't do that. Well, why would I do that? You know, the Holy Spirit really gave me an analogy on the spot, said, uh, Mom, what if my son would come home one night and he had run a red light and the police comes with him and said, Mr. Melnick, how would you like to pay for the ticket that we gave your son? I would look at them and said, excuse me, he's of age, he knows the law, he broke the law, he is responsible, don't hold me responsible. And I told my mom, this is the same with God. You cannot hold God responsible for what men did to other men. And to my surprise, she agreed. And then I said, you know, that's where I gave my life to Jesus because I wanted him to change me and make me the person that he's been working on for the last 34 years. And, and I said, if you want to pray, we can pray together. And she agreed. And we prayed together. That was, of course, a lot of joy, a lot of tears. And then five hours later, we went to the hospital where my father was. 
and I read him some letters that my wife and my uh, two kids wrote for their, you know, their grandpa because they couldn't come. All letters saying the same thing. Grandpa, please listen to Olivier, to dad, to what he, to my husband, what he's going to say about God and about Jesus. One more time, just listen to him. So I told my dad, I want to read those letters, which I did. And then I said, by the way, mom and I prayed this morning and then she gave her life to Jesus and she's going to spend eternity with God, with me and, and my wife and the kids, and it really would be nice if you could be in eternity with us because the alternative is not that nice. And, you know, I thought my dad was going to get mad, and I said, we, you know, we can pray right now. You can just invite him in, in your heart because very soon you'll be in the presence of God. You'll have to, it'll be too late. And to my surprise, my dad nodded yes, and because he couldn't talk anymore because he had throat cancer, basically he prayed uh, with me by squeezing my finger every time he meant yes uh, to something I said, and I led him through the sinner's prayer by being a sinner being separated from God and uh, not being able to save himself and that uh, Yeshua died, uh, Jesus, Yeshua died for his sins and uh, he invited him in his heart. And a squeeze at a time, we uh, we prayed that prayer and then uh, 10 days later, he uh, went home to be with the Lord. Mm. Well, that's a, that's a wonderfully uplifting story, Olivier. Again, I've been talking to for the last couple of segments with Olivier Melnick, Chosen People Ministries, but you can learn a lot more at newantisemitism.com, including his book, End Times Antisemitism, A New Chapter in the Longest Hatred. We're not carrying it, so best not to call here. We can't give out phone numbers, just newantisemitism.com. Thanks for all you do, Olivier. Appreciate it so much, Thank and you, we man. will stay in touch. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Bye now. Up next on Understanding the Times, we go on the college campus to find out what students know about the Holocaust. You don't want to miss that. Don't forget, video and audio copies of the Understanding the Times conference held just last month are available now. Order your 2017 conference memories on DVD or CD by phoning 763-559-4444 or when you visit olivetreeviews.org. You can help this ministry by becoming one of our financial partners. Please send your tax-deductible contributions to Olive Tree Ministries, Post Office Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. Jen returns right after this. Thanks for standing with this radio outreach, both prayerfully and financially, for 17 years. I have always tried to give you the good news amidst the troubling headlines that we read daily. The Bible says that without hope, the people perish. Well, there is hope today, but that is rooted in the message of the Bible. The King is coming. If you are ready to meet him, then be encouraged. But would you keep this message on air in our over 800 radio markets with a year-end gift online at olivetreeviews.org or call us at 763-559-4444, 763-559-4444. You can drop us a tax-deductible gift to Olive Tree Ministries, Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311, Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. We want to equip you for today and tomorrow. We want to provide news, views, and truths, but more than that, make sure you are ready to meet the King. This is Jan Markell. Many Christian leaders avoid the topics of our day, but here on this program, we hit them head on. The times demand we address the hard issues and bring a biblical viewpoint into focus. Thanks for joining us veteran television and radio personality, Rhonda Fink-Whitman is Jan's next guest on Understanding the Times. A longtime Jewish educator, Rhonda visited college campuses and was surprised by the ignorance of students about the Holocaust. Jan Markell explains more. And welcome back. Remember, you can get a CD of any program. Just give us a call if you'd like a CD of this program or any program that we do on air. And I hope you'll join our discussion on our Facebook page, Jan Markell's Olive Tree Ministries. Follow us on Twitter at Olive Tree Men. We're going to wrap up this hour, and I'm kind of staying in the genre of the first two segments. And I want to play a, that's a little clip. It's roughly 10, 11 minutes long. And it's a Kind of an award-winning 
a little video from online produced by Rhonda Fink Whitman, and she's a veteran TV and radio personality, award-winning screenwriter, and she's author of a, a novel, which really isn't my point here. I'm not trying to promote her so much, but she's the daughter of a Holocaust survivor. So we're kind of staying in, with this theme. And as the survivors of the Holocaust become fewer and fewer, as you all know, Rhonda hits the college campuses, and she's going to quiz some college students, and she ends up being appalled, as am I, by the ignorance of the students that she's talking to in Pennsylvania. She kind of says the way to prevent what's going on anywhere and everywhere is to be educated about what happened historically, and for that matter, what's happening now is it concerns even Christian persecution. So she made this little online film, and uh, her appeal is that there are some states who are appropriately educating high school students. They would be New York, New Jersey, Illinois, California, and Florida in Holocaust history. Holocaust studies is mandatory in those five states. And then she talks to some of those students who can answer her questions. The others have had no, well, quite frankly, you will hear students who can't answer the most basic questions. She's not blaming the students. She's really blaming the educational system. Let's play that little clip. It's 10, 11 minutes long, and then I'll come back and wrap things up. Oh, hey, hi. I'm Rhonda Fink Whitman, author of 94 Maidens. It's a Holocaust story inspired by true events. It's a story about how my mother survived the Holocaust. It's no secret I've been pushing my home state of Pennsylvania to make Holocaust education mandatory in classroom. We're talking public and charter schools, grades 6 through 12. I'm concerned as the daughter of a Holocaust survivor, as an educator, as a mother of college-age kids, and as a human being, because genocide is going on today, right now. But you can't blame the kids. No one's teaching it to them. By the time they get to a college campus, they should know a thing or two about the Holocaust and other genocides so that when the plague of denial creeps onto their campus, they're armed and ready with the truth. Let's find out what they do or don't know about the Holocaust. You went to public school in Pennsylvania. Yes. And I'm just going to ask you a few questions, some general history questions. Okay. What was the Holocaust? The Holocaust, um, I'm on the spot now. Where did the Holocaust happen? I have no idea. Where did it start? Which country? I have no idea. Is it Europe? I don't think so. <laughs> Which country was Adolf Hitler the leader of? I think it's Amsterdam. Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> About how many years ago do you think? Um, 1800? Or I want to say like 300 years ago, maybe. What were the prison camps called? Common, what are they commonly known as? I know this. I don't remember. It begins with a C. Concentration camps. <laughs> there you go. Can you name one? No. Not one? Nope. Can you name a concentration camp? No. What was Auschwitz? I don't know. <laughs> um, I'm not sure. What was the night of broken glass? I don't know. What was the night of broken glass? I do not know. I don't know. What were the Nuremberg Laws? Once again, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know that one. What were the Nuremberg Trials? I don't know. What was the significance of a ship called the St. Louis? Don't know. Which United States president was responsible for sending a boatload of Jews back to a certain death in Europe? Not sure. Never heard that one. I don't know. Have you ever heard that before? No, I haven't. Did you look surprised when I said that? You never heard that story? No, I didn't. I've never heard it. What was the final solution? Uh, I think it was... Uh, just at the end of the World War II, they just, uh, the, it was the Nuremberg trials against the, uh, war crimes against the, uh, Nazi party. Um, what do you mean by final solution? For what, what, what was his plan that he called the final solution? Oh, I don't know then. Do you know how many Jews were murdered? I'm not sure. I want to say, I want to say three million, but I'm, I'm, I have no idea. Higher? Higher? Is it, uh, 300 million? No. Hundreds of thousands. <laughs> That'd be my best guess. I want to say like a million. I'm not sure. Uh, what other groups were targeted besides Jewish people? Um, the African Americans. Here in the United States, they used to be like discriminated because skin color and like the whites, especially American people, they used to like put them aside. Because of what, what about in Europe? Who did the Nazis target besides the Jews in Europe? I don't know. What type of experiments were done on prisoners of Auschwitz? I don't know. What did they do to twins in Auschwitz? 
have no idea. Why did the Americans storm the beaches of Normandy? I have no idea. Where is Normandy? Um, so, like, I mean, it's over near, like, England and Germany and all that jazz. I think it's, like, it's not a peninsula, but, like, do you know? I can look at the map, and I'm, like, picturing the part that comes down. And it's, like, over in there. Like, Which country? Normandy. It's over by, um, it's over by Germany. I know that. Like, at least compared to the United States, it's over by Germany. Like, probably not, not, much more, not much more help than that. Which event thrust the United States into World War II? Um, I believe it was the murder of the of Franz Ferdinand. Yeah, Franz Ferdinand. I think it wasn't it the Holocaust. I believe it was the start of the Holocaust. What was the ghetto uprising and where did it take place? Um, I don't know that either. What did they tattoo on prisoners' arms at Auschwitz? I want to say the Star of David, but I'm not really sure on what the tattoo was. What U.S. general ordered his troops to take pictures of what they found at the camps when they got there so that no one would ever deny or forget what they did? I don't know. I don't know his name. Who was Joseph Mengele? Not sure. Who was the president of the United States during World War II, during the Holocaust? World War II. Was it Wilson? Woodrow Wilson? No. Uh, I want to say Eisenhower, but I'm probably wrong. Was it JFK? Who was Winston Churchill? He was a general. I know that, right? Or he was involved in the military somehow. But Which military? Uh, I think the U.S. one, right? No? Okay, well. Who were known as the Allies? The Allies of Hitler? Or of- they were called the Allies of America. Russia, maybe? Russia? Um... That's all I have. Who were the allies? Uh, that was... Ooh. Was that like, um... In, no, that was... History is kind of spotty. Um, um... This is embarrassing. Any hints? Who was Anne Frank? I never read that book. <laughs> what did the Nazis make the Jews wear to identify them as Jews? Ooh. I don't know. <laughs> what was the Holocaust? Um, that was, that happened during World War II. Um, Hitler organized it. Um, he believed that Jews were, had dirty blood and they had to be erased. So he organized concentration camps and put them all through torture and a lot of deaths, a lot of just horrible cruelty. Can you name a concentration camp? Auschwitz. Um, I took a class on this actually in high school. Um, you took a class on this in high school. Yeah. Did you go to public school in Pennsylvania? No, New Jersey. What other groups of people were targeted by the Nazis? Uh, gypsies, homosexuals, um, disabled, I think even twins. Well, they do experiments on twins. I know, I know they did a terrible experiment because I, I went to the museum, Holocaust Museum. New Jersey went to the museum. In Washington, D.C.? Yes. We went field trip actually in high school all everyone it wasn't even just the class it was my whole grade one so that was really really cool to see when did the holocaust happen 1941 42 new jersey new jersey all correct uh were were there any survivors um have you met any no i wish i wish i think we're supposed to have a survivor come into class but we, we couldn't organize one but um no i haven't met anyone what were the nuremberg laws Oh, uh, they were laws that um, prohibited many Jews from doing daily daily tasks that people should. Is that wrong? That's right. What type of experiments were done on prisoners in Auschwitz? Um, medical experiments. What did they do to twins in Auschwitz? Oh, they did crazy stuff to the twins. You seem to know uh, quite a bit about the Holocaust. Are, did you go to school, public school in Pennsylvania? No, I went to public school in um, Long Island, New York. What is genocide? The word sounds so familiar to me, but I just can't remember. What is genocide? Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Remember, it was Edmund Burke who said, all that's necessary for evil to prosper is for good men to do nothing. And today, as I said a minute ago, there's continuing genocide. Today, the target is often Christians. But personally, I think Westerners comfortable in their upscale homes and enjoying the good life, well, they don't care to get involved. Uh, They aren't involved in the sins of the past or the present. It doesn't make them feel good. And even today's pulpits emphasize topics that make people feel comfortable. So I consider today's apathy and indifference 
two of the most disturbing indicators of a perverse generation, and that includes some Christians. We cannot be indifferent to the suffering of millions of people, many of them carrying the cross of Christ, nor can we be silent about the longest hatred, the oldest hatred, the hatred of the Jewish people who gave us our Bible and our Messiah. So I'm going out of the program here, quoting something from the introduction of my book, Trapped in Hitler's Hell, and it reads this. This is something that's uh, in the introduction of the book. There is something unprecedented about the European Holocaust. For the first time in the blood-stained history of the human race, a decision was birthed in a modern state in the midst of a civilized continent to track down, register, mark, isolate, dispossess, humiliate, concentrate, transport, and murder every single person of an ethnic group as defined by the perpetrators. This was targeted at an ethnic group who so generously contributed to the culture of the world, to a people who have borne the brunt of enmity towards them because they dared to be different and dared to insist on being different. This resolution was targeted at an ethnic group who have so generously contributed to the world culture, yet have borne the brunt of enmity toward them because they dared to be different and to insist on their difference. Remember, folks, Christianity is Jewish. Jesus, the Messiah, is Jewish. I want to thank you for listening. We'll talk to you next week. Thank you for joining us for today's Understanding the Times Radio with Jan Markell. Across America and across the World Wide Web, we continue to report current events from a biblical perspective. Every week, this broadcast comes to you at no cost, but it costs us thousands of dollars. As we produce and distribute this weekend media outreach, would you consider becoming our partner? With an ever-changing world, men and women of faith need to keep informed. They need to be aware of current events as viewed through the lens of Scripture. Week after week, Jan Markell brings you a compelling hour of discussion to point out the dangers in today's culture and to bring hope through faith in Jesus Christ. Do consider joining us in this listener-supported ministry as our financial partner. Please write with your tax-deductible gifts to Olive Tree Ministries, Post Office Box 1452, Maple Grove, Minnesota, 55311. Contributions are also accepted at olivetreeviews.org or by phone when you call 763-559-4444. Don't forget, global updates with a biblical worldview are yours around the clock at olivetreeviews.org. We look forward to hearing from you very soon. We appreciate your continued prayer support for Jan and her media team. Next week, Jan Markell returns with another information and inspiration-packed hour designed to help you understand the times. Whoa.